Picture this. You're scrolling through Twitter on a day unlike any other. You're perusing the latest memes and posts from your favorite accounts. Then, you see it. A tweet from an account that has lain dormant for three years. The unthinkable has happened. The Homestuck Twitter has just posted one word. Update. As of October 8th, 2023, Homestuck 2 Beyond Canon has returned. After being on hiatus since Christmas of 2020, we received our first update in almost three years, and, in true Homestuck fashion, immediately after this announcement, the Homestuck 2 site crashed. But, much to the surprise of many, this update was not the full completion of the comic, as was promised after the privatization of the project in 2020. What we got instead was about a regular update's worth of new content, and an update to the site's news page. This news bulletin was posted not by Andrew or Aisha, as some may have expected, but instead by James Roach, a popular Homestuck collaborator and musician. The post reads as follows. Hi, James here. You may know me as someone who's worked on music for Hive Swap. Maybe you know me from my awful social media posts. I also wrote a few things for Pester Quest. Now I'm in charge of a new team of people inheriting everyone's favorite webcomic franchise. So, beyond canon, huh? As some of you may know, I've been trying to get some Homestuck projects off the ground. A few of those things saw some movement, I'm still crossing my fingers about those vinyls, and at some point I swore to some Rosemary shippers that I'd make sure there was more content if we won an internet poll, which we did, by a complete landslide. Absolutely fucking washed those clowns. Love wins. About a year ago, Andrew approached me with the idea of finishing the Homestuck Squared story, which was originally just called Homestuck Beyond Canon. And after a few months of kicking around ideas and finding the right team of people, we're back, baby. It feels great. I am genuinely so excited to show you the stuff we've been cooking up. I know the last thing anybody said about it is that it would be written in full and dropped all at once, but that was maybe a bit of wishful thinking. We've all been there. As time went on and people started moving on to new things, various opportunities and difficulties arose, and ultimately plans changed. As such, the torch has been passed to me. To address one of several elephants in the room, yes, this is a new team of people. Andrew has been calling this part of the Homestuck Independent Creative Union, which he explained a little bit on the About page. I've handpicked a group of writers and artists I trust, and I want to move forward with the fandom and start having fun again. I want to be more transparent and engage with the community more. I don't know if I always agree that no news is good news. So I want to try a more open policy, even if the news is kind of mundane. Sometimes the people just want to know that we're still doing anything. Fair enough. In the coming weeks, check back here and there will be more news, more announcements, and more questions answered. I hope the story we tell is as fun for you guys to read as it has been to make. I'll also include the description of the Homestuck Independent Creative Union as written by Andrew. The Homestuck Independent Creative Union, HICU, is a union of creative contributors which was established to consolidate members of future Homestuck projects, beginning with the launch of Homestuck Beyond Canon. HICU is a totally independent entity from Andrew, What Pumpkin, Viz Media, or any other corporate interest. Andrew has given the union a free license, so they may legally work within the full Homestuck universe and monetize their efforts to support the members. The union is both creatively and financially independent, and no outside individuals or companies are receiving any royalties or payments. Only the members benefit, and income will be distributed among members as equitably as possible. Andrew is not creatively involved with these projects in any direct way, but remains available to the union for consultation at their request. So, James Roach has seemingly taken the wheel of the Homestuck 2 project, which I could not be more happy about. There has never been a more vocal and open member of the Homestuck team than James, not to mention one that interfaces with the community so well. I have high hopes for what he and his team will bring to the project. As far as the HICU goes, I believe that this is also a great way for Homestuck properties to move forward. Famously, selling the rights to Viz Media proved to be somewhat of a disaster for Homestuck, as it saw a rapid decline in quality after that transaction. The website began decaying with the end of Adobe Flash Player, and the official re-uploads of the animations were in terribly low quality. 
Also, the publication of the official Homestuck books was scuffed by Viz, stopping in Act 5 with no continuation seemingly in sight. The media empire that is Homestuck as of late has been no stranger to controversy, but this new team seems promising, and I trust James Roach's leadership of them moving forward. The unofficially official follow-up to Homestuck continuing as an independent project with no corporate interest is probably the best approach they could have possibly taken to this. The independence of the project also seems to be why they are now leaning more into the Beyond Canon subtitle, rather than calling it Homestuck 2. Also noteworthy is the fact that Andrew will only be involved as a consultant for the project as needed. While Homestuck is largely Andrew's brainchild, it is definitely time for them to step away and pursue other goals, as we've seen them do with Psycholonials. As Homestuck's creator, most controversy surrounding the comic can unfortunately be traced directly back to Andrew, as I've discussed briefly in earlier videos. Andrew has time and time again found themselves placed upon the proverbial gallows by Homestuck's community, and after a decade of this, I can see anyone wanting to take a step back from it all. I believe that letting a new team take the reins and steer the comic in new ways is a wise choice, and one that will let Andrew finally remove themselves enough from Homestuck so that they can focus on other creative work. So, if you haven't ever read Homestuck Beyond Canon, now may be a great time to start. This is where this video now shifts to a sort of starting guide for the newest content. The rest of the video will be split into three main sections. James's other news posts, the epilogues, and Homestuck Beyond Canon up to now. I will have all the timestamps for these sections visible on screen now, so feel free to jump to wherever you see appropriate for yourself to start. But without further ado, here is some news from the desk of James Roach. After the initial post announcing HSBC's return, James has updated us several times on the news blog. On October 18th, he made a post announcing that the Homestuck Patreon would soon be reopening. His plans for this essentially boils down to the following, in his own words. The Patreon is coming back and will begin again starting November 1st. The money from this goes directly and entirely to the HSBC team. We operate independently from What Pumpkin and Viz Media, and we will not be paying them. Another update will be coming in October. Starting in November, updates will begin once a month while we feel things out. A small percentage of funds is going to the S pages, merch, and more music. The second update was posted on the 25th and consisted of James introducing us to many of the members of his team. Kim, Andy, Chumi, Haven, Floral, and Miles are all introduced to us, and James comments that the project would not be possible without their help. The most recent news update was posted on October 30th, the same day as the Patreon relaunch, and consists mostly of an FAQ. Here it is, edited down for time and brevity. The full post can be found in the news section of Homestuck2.com. Why drop Squared from the name? In the original outline, it was just called Homestuck Beyond Canon. Andrew mentioned the old team pushed for the Squared, but it wasn't actually the sequel in the traditional sense. Functionally, it serves to distinguish this as a new production, but I also just thought it sounded better. How much communication is there between you and the old team? Will the story follow their outline? Will it follow Andrew's outline? We do not have that much contact with the previous directors, if any. I have not spoken to many of them in years on account of them having their own life to live. While there seems to be a misunderstanding that I asked the previous lead director to join this project, that is not the case. I did not, and I cannot, envision a scenario where it would be appropriate for me to do so. My guess is they were asked in the early days of the hiatus by someone other than me. I did, however, contact the previous lead director to tell them what I'd be doing, because I didn't want them to be blindsided by it. I didn't want anyone using it as an excuse to further interrupt their life. In general, I would like this discussion put to rest. We are following a few broader strokes of these old outlines that have already been established in the story and we are writing the rest of it from the ground up, building upon the foundation of our predecessors and making something new. Any chance that PesterQuest, especially Dirk and Aradia's roots, being relevant to HSBC in the future? I was talking about a particular story point in the writer's room recently. Before there is too much confusion, this is not a physical place, just a Discord channel. Haha. <laughs> and the consensus is we do not want to make it necessary to consume paid content to understand the story. Are they relevant? Yes. Are they essential? No. There is already at least one reference to PesterQuest in what I've been calling the prologue or the original Helmstuck Squared chapters. I wrote it in a fit of self-indulgence. 
Will the bonus updates continue? I think we would like to fold them into the main story in some way. As I mentioned in the previous answer, it felt unfair to paywall content that should be relevant. There is a big opportunity to do so that will happen later in the story, and we all really loved them, so I hope so. Now that you own the rights to Homestuck, what are your merch plans? Will you make blank? What about the books? Will you ever bring back blank? First, some clarification. I do not own Homestuck. The HICU has legally acquired a license from the creator of the IP to work with the property and monetize it. On top of this, Andrew has asked me officially to finish the story and given me complete creative control over its direction. These are two separate but important points. I was asked to do this, and then we tirelessly worked at finding us a way to allow us to do it and pay the people who are doing it. And so the HICU was born. Before I get too carried away, let's talk merch. We were allowed to make merch and sell it. We have the legal rights to do so. We want to. We have talked about a number of things that we want to make. This will take time and cost money. Some of the ideas we've kicked around include apparel, collectibles, and physical album releases. Will all these happen? I'm not sure, but I would like them to. I am currently in talks with some people about a Best of Homestuck collection on vinyl, but we'll need to contact each musician individually and sort that out before we can proceed. Since I do not make the Homestuck books, I do not know what's happening there. There have been some changes, but I do not know the details because I am not actually like the new CEO of Homestuck or anything. It's not that I won't tell you, it's just that I don't know because I only know what's going on with HICU stuff. Similarly, because we aren't the ones who made the old merch, there isn't really much I can do in terms of bringing it back. Though maybe we could make a better version of it. If you want to see some old stuff, maybe hit up Topatico. They recently started reprinting some of the old shirt designs. Neat! If it was for fans by fans product, you might be uh, completely out of luck. I don't think that company exists at all anymore. I think what happened is Good Smile US acquired their overstock at some point and was just selling it all until they ran out. Fix blank. Are you going to retcon blank? Will blank get a redemption arc? When will we see blank again? I see a lot of you chuckleheads out there saying, make this ship canon or put this character back into the comments, and it genuinely warms my heart to see people who are so passionate about this thing they love. That's who I'm doing this for. The most of these questions, and I use that phrase very generously, can be answered by simply asking for you to wait and see. But there are a handful of questions I avoided answering on social media because I feel they needed appropriate thought and care in order to answer them in a satisfying way. I'm sorry if this seemed like I was dodging talking about some of the more sensitive, important concerns people have. The short answer to this is that we want to resolve these threads in the story. I know there were more than a few baffling decisions made by the people that came before us, but I think ignoring them entirely and retconning the parts of it that are actually in the text already wouldn't be satisfying for anybody. It's a quick fix for a larger problem. We love these characters. I do not want to punish them for existing or turn them into one-dimensional tasteless jokes. I think the only way to give these issues a satisfying resolution is going to be to handle them with the delicacy and care they deserve. These characters are in the hands of people who genuinely care about how they fit into their world. We are tirelessly working at handling these decisions in a satisfying and respectful way. This will take time, but I know it will be worth it. If you still have doubts, I think that's fair. As I've said before, it is going to take a lot of effort on our part to mend the ties between us and the fandom, but I think we all want that. All I can ask is that you please give us a chance to try and resolve these threads in story in a way that is exciting and satisfying for the readers and writers alike, but also respectful to the experience of the characters. Will there be regular updates? Yes, updates will be once a month. We are hoping to up this number in the future, or at least make the updates a little more robust. Since we are telling this story in narrative pieces instead of a chapter-based format, sections will have varying length. We also want to try different ways of updating too. Maybe one page at a time, like the old school Homestuck. Maybe posting it in chunks once a week. Can I buy a license too? No. This was a special circumstance, but don't lose hope just yet. I don't control this or the speed at which it happens, but there are plans to expand into other things as well. This will take a lot of time and we are just barely getting started. 
And while I can appreciate the hustle, please do not send me your projects until I ask for them. Well, are there at least plans for more projects? Yes, that is the ultimate plan for the HICU. We'd like to expand into other things as well. What I don't want to do here is overpromise and underdeliver. Will we do X? Will we do Y? Z? I would love to, but for now we're focused on HSBC and some community outreach. As Yoshi P, if you know you know, is so fond of saying, please look forward to it. How can I join the HICU? Is HSBC team hiring? I don't want you to get too excited, I'll be frank with you. We're not currently in open recruitment and have the manpower we need for now. If we want to bring on more people, there's already a short list of people I'd choose. I've had a lot of people say they want to volunteer, but I am very careful and selective about who I bring onto this team because it is important to me that I can trust them implicitly. Is there any plan to fix the old Homestuck pages? Unfortunately, I don't know. That's not really under my team's umbrella. I don't actually know who would be the one to fix that. What Pokemon would Vriska have? Somebody asked me this as a joke on Reddit, and I've been thinking about it all day. I don't know enough about Pokemon to answer this in a meaningful way, so I have to defer to Haven, who had the following to say. Vriska would have a Zacian because it's a legendary. It's blue, it's overpowered as shit, and its Pokedex number is 888. With the news out of the way, we can now shift into the proper reading material to consume before reacquainting ourselves with HSBC. Before beginning, you should of course finish reading Homestuck proper first, no small feat, I know, and then move on to the epilogues. You should know before going into this that they are very long and wordy, and unlike the original comic, the epilogues have no images to go alongside them. Also, there are two separate epilogues, and the idea is that you should read both of them, even though they are sort of presented as a choose-your-own-adventure story. Very early on, a choice is presented to John, which leads to two different branching story paths, but both stories contain necessary context for the events of HSBC. As such, the epilogues are also considered dubiously canon, when compared to Homestuck's main plot. Many in the fandom will also tell you that the epilogues are not the strongest point of Homestuck, to put it lightly. Some of the characterization choices and writing leave a bad taste in some readers' mouths, although I personally did not find it that bad at all. This, paired with the length and presentation of this section, pushes a lot of people away from it altogether. Luckily, in case you're still unsure, the Homestuck 2 website also includes an official Sparknotes version of the epilogues, which I will also conveniently read for you now, just in case that is something you want. If not, feel free to skip to the next timestamp. Prologue Homestuck has finished. On Earthsea, ten years after his adventure began, John Egbert awakes from a traumatic anime dream. Rose Lalonde summons him to her home. She is gravely ill. Her awareness of her many alternate selves and other timelines is increasing beyond the capacity of her physical body. She is ascending towards her ultimate self, and it is terrible. Rose explains to John that canon is predicated on three core principles, truth, relevance, and essentiality. She states that unless John travels back into canon and defeats Lord English, an event which is known to happen, the fundamental truth of their existence on Earthsea will be undermined. Rose claims that this will lead to an effect she terms dissipation, a retroactive discreditation of everything that has transpired since their victory seven years prior. She gives John a set of instructions for how to avert this effect, and sends him on his way. Before leaving Earthsea, John has a picnic with Roxy and Calliope. He discusses his options with the two of them. They suggest that John has a choice in the matter. He could go to defeat Lord English and validate the canonical sequence of events concretely, or he could alternatively choose to remain on Earthsea and forego the final battle altogether. But first, Calliope offers John an apparently different choice. What will he eat for lunch? Meat or candy? If you choose meat, these are the events from John's perspective. Upon making his choice, John is placated by the red meat, but only temporarily. His thoughts turn to Lord English and the various horrible crimes committed by him. John decides that he must leave Earthsea, return to canon, and kill L.E., thereby completing the sequence of events necessary to prevent canonical dissipation. He says farewell to Roxy and Calliope, and makes his departure. 
Following Rose's instructions, John first travels to the Game Over timeline, to the moment when Arania makes her attempt to appropriate the Ring of Life and doom everyone. He knocks her out and takes the ring, thereby diverting this timeline from the original sequence of events. John leaves Gamzee in the fridge where he belongs. Now that this timeline has been splintered off from canon, its residents are available for other purposes. As such, John now recruits the remaining kids as 16-year-olds for the final fight with L.E. The eight of them return to Earth A a week before April 13th, 2009 to formulate their battle plans. And then, it's showtime. John and the teens arrive at the site of Caliborn's masterpiece. Upon the delivery of a scathing assessment of the young cherub's artistic prowess and a punchline long in the making, the final battle commences. A whole bunch of shit happens that we already saw, but not in plasticine form this time. John, Rose, Dave, and Jade all end up stuck inside the House MacGuffin, where they remain until Vriska deploys it in several quadrillion years' time. John has an important revelation about his mental health in the meanwhile. When they emerge, the second final battle is already in progress. Calliope's black hole has swallowed the green sun and started to consume Paradox space, but the final blow to L.E. is yet to be inflicted. The kids join the fight alongside the army of Dream Bubble Ghosts, including Mina and Tavros. Things quickly take a turn for the dire. Rose is consumed in a beam of energy. Jade is fatally impaled on a shard of the void. Tavros is disintegrated, and Mina seemingly is thrown into the singularity. Only John and Dave remain. However, they are aided at the last minute by Dave Peter Sprite Squared, who rescues John from being eaten by L.E. Dave is not so fortunate, I mean fortunate, and is decapitated. In retaliation, Dave Pita impales L.E. on their claws and flies into the black hole with him in tow. The fight is won, but at a terrible cost. John has been skewered by one of L.E.'s teeth and begins to fall prey to a deadly venom. He loses consciousness. He is soon compelled to awaken by an external influence he cannot identify. John contemplates the inherent futility of this existence before coming across his dad's wallet modus and taking it with him. He finds Mina, not yet double dead, clinging to a server beacon. She steals the Ring of Life from him and makes her escape through the black hole. He then encounters Terezi, who has been searching for Vriska for an indeterminate amount of time, and who is on the brink of starvation. John deploys the contents of his father's wallet. Terezi gorges herself on a hearty meal of pipe tobacco and shaving cream. John cannot help but be smitten. For several days, the pair of them camp out in John's dad's spare car. Eventually, Terezi offers to remove the tooth still embedded in John's abdomen. He assents, and she performs the impromptu surgery. In the heat of the moment, the two embrace passionately. Then they fuck in the backseat of the car, and that's really all there is to say on the matter. John convinces Terezi to return to Earth Sea with him. But when they arrive, our hero finally succumbs to Ellie's venom, which has the effect of corroding a person's canonical existence beyond any hope of revival. John Egbert dies in Terezi's arms, ostensibly for good. His story is at an end. Now for the events of Earth C. Things have been getting political. Jane Crocker has decided to run for the presidency of Earth, the first time one of the 12 players has attempted such a maneuver. There is a sinister pretext to her bid for power. This year is the first time that the new Mother Grub will be used to propagate the troll population on Earth C, as opposed to simple cloning. Jane is running on a platform which many suspect would curtail the reproductive rights of the troll race on Earth C, and which Carcat and Dave believe to be some real xenophobic bullshit. Dave also thinks that Jane's economic plans leave something to be desired. He convinces Carcat to campaign in opposition of her. The two discuss the likely allegiances of their remaining friends, who together comprise the most powerful and influential people on the planet. Kanaya, Rose, and Jade will be likely allies to their cause. Dirk, Jane's campaign manager, is already accounted for. Roxy and Calliope are neutral parties, as is Jake. English, the most successful celebrity figure of them all, will be the deciding factor in the election, with both sides furiously courting his endorsement. Once their plan is decided, Dave gets a call from his brother. Dirk holds up a live episode of Rumble in Da Pumpkin Patch, a rap battle robot wrestling hybrid which he co-hosts with Jake, in order to have this conversation. The crowd is not amused. After soliloquizing ominously to Dave for a while, Dirk hangs up and resumes the show. Jake proceeds to perform the worst rap in the history of Paradox Space. Dirk then tranquilizes him and ends the episode in order to field a call from Rose, who was contacting him to discuss her condition. 
Dirk reveals that he is already aware of this apparent secret, and moreover that he is suffering from the same sickness despite not showing any of the same symptoms. He invites Rose to his studio to discuss the matter further. Sometime later, Dave, Carcat, and Jade discuss strategy. Things quickly take a turn for the uncomfortable, however, as Jade manages to turn the conversation to the subject of their three-way relationship dynamic. In particular, she focuses on Dave and Carcat's feelings for each other. Dave and Carcat vehemently deny any romantic feelings despite literally all evidence to the contrary. Jade draws a shipping grid and leaves the two of them to think about it. They pretend not to think about it very, very hard indeed. Jane attempts to woo Jake to her campaign unsuccessfully. Not to be deterred, she invites him to her office where she tries to seduce him physically as well as politically. In this moment of intimacy, Jake's thoughts cannot help but turn to Dirk, however. He makes his excuses and leaves. Jane furiously rings her campaign manager, unaware that he is the reason for this unfortuitous development. Dirk offers to deal with Jake before hanging up quickly as Rose arrives. The two need to talk. Over the course of the conversation, Rose's condition deteriorates further before she loses consciousness. Dirk, who has secretly already come into his own as an ascended self, openly claims control of the narrative of Homestuck. The prince is awake, and our shit is wrecked. Jade attempts to persuade Roxy and Calliope to endorse Carcat's campaign, but they are unconvinced. Roxy is unwilling to go against such a close friend, and Callie is uncomfortable with taking sides. The two of them come out as non-binary, to Jade's and Dirk's surprise. At a moment circumstantially simultaneous with her alternate self's death in the furthest ring, Jade suddenly passes out. This alternate self, experiencing her last moments after the battle with L.E., approaches the supermassive black hole which was once the green sun. She is beckoned forward by the voice of Calliope's god to yourself, who speaks in the narrative text in opposition to Dirk. He panics and quickly shifts our focus back to Earth. Dave and Karkat visit Kanaya in the Brooding Caverns and discuss the election. Kanaya reveals that Jane has already visited the caverns in an attempt to curry favor with the Troll Kingdom. Kanaya believes that while Crocker's intentions may be good, her xenophobic beliefs about troll reproduction border on the fascistic and are too dangerous to be ignored. She agrees to aid Karkat's campaign and then attempts to phone Rose. Dirk picks up instead. He rebuffs Kanaya's inquiries into her wife's health, hanging up on her in order to continue talking with Rose, who is now very weak. She is on the verge of ascension, her physical body barely able to contain her higher self. So far, she has resisted the urge, but Dirk convinces her to fail to resist the urge. From this point on, he holds her physical body together with his powers until such time as he is able to deposit her soul into a vessel of his own construction. Teen Jade falls into the black hole. The dead cherub uses her as a beacon to gain access to the narrative, now openly challenging Dirk's control. The two fight for supremacy as the adult Jade wakes up on Earth Sea. Her newfound consciousness and the battle are both short-lived, however, as the dead cherub takes possession of her body and the narrative in one fell swoop. The prince is, for the moment, outmatched. Jane returns from the campaign trail, where she has been using trickster mode as a publicity strategy. Dirk warns her against overindulgence, and the two discuss the Jake stakes once again. Dirk says that he is working on a backup plan, now that his influence has been curtailed somewhat. Meanwhile, Dave and Carcat successfully convince Jake to endorse their campaign, and Team Vantis organize a stadium event to announce this fact. Things do not go according to plan. While Dave and Roxy discuss the queer experience at the rally, Dirk ascends the bell tower with Roxy's red sniper rifle in hand, apparently intending to assassinate or tranquilize Jake during his speech. The dead cherub attempts to stop him through narrative fiat, but is outwitted. Dirk, in fact, snipes Jade with the tranquilizer dart, which has the effect of ending the dead cherub's possession. Without Jade to act as her beacon, she is forced to relinquish narrative control to the prince. Back in the stadium, Jake declares his love for Dirk Strider and switches his endorsement at the last minute. The Vantis campaign collapses, and Jane coasts into office unopposed. A month passes. Jade remains comatose in the hospital during this time. Terezi, who recently returned to Earth with John, meets Roxy outside. After the two catch up and Roxy departs, Dirk reveals that he and Rose will be leaving Earthsea momentarily, and invites Terezi to join them. She brings John's capsulogged corpse with her. Rose and Dirk prepare for their departure. 
Dirk uses Kanaya's insecurities to manipulate her into accepting her wife's, quote, decision to leave, simultaneously convincing Rose that Kanaya has no qualms in letting her go. Dirk leaves Kanaya the antidote for the tranquilizer that he used on Jade before making his way to Jake's mansion. Once there, he requests the use of the fastest Skyanet starship available. Jake, who is now completely and openly infatuated with Dirk, and who believes that he will be coming along on this voyage, readily obliges. Dirk gives him the bad news. Anglish will be staying behind with Jane, ready to serve as the father to countless generations of her new presidential dictatorship. He kisses Jake one last time, saying that they will never meet again. Back at Dave and Karkat's house, the two mourn their political careers. The commiseration session takes a turn for the personal, and they discuss their relationship, subtly and not so subtly, egged on by an impatient Dirk. The two affirm their friendship, but this time it's not enough. For once in his life, Dave takes the initiative. They kiss. Dave Cat is canon. Kanaya and Roxy visit Jade in the hospital. Calliope, who was negatively affected by the presence of their dead alternate self, has since shut themselves in at home and begun religiously scrawling on the walls. Kanaya gives Jade the antidote, and she wakes up. Jade, who is now somehow aware of Dirk's influence, declares that he must be stopped. Dirk agrees with her, claiming his role as the villain of the story outright. He accepts the intrinsic antagonism of his narrative power, and has decided to carry that antagonism to its natural conclusion. He states that his eventual death will be just. Kanaya realizes the extent of Dirk's manipulation, but it is too late. He is already gone. The dead cherub resumes her possession of Jade and seizes the narrative once more. Though she has sworn neutrality, she points the remaining players in the direction that Dirk, Rose, and Terezi have fled. Kanaya, Roxy, Dave, and Karkat resolve to give chase. Years later, we see Dirk, Rose, now in a robot body, and Terezi approach a new planet. The most important suburb session in the history of existence is about to unfold. If you chose candy, meanwhile, inside the black hole, another timeline has been in progress. In this timeline, John chooses to eat candy at the picnic instead of meat. Upon doing so, he starts feeling sweet and sentimental about the time with his friends that he missed out on while holed up at home, and which he now risks sacrificing by leaving. He chooses to ignore Lord English and stay on Earth, to Roxy and Calliope's approval. This failure to validate canon leads John to suspect that his existence is somehow insubstantial and meaningless. Calliope distracts him with one final task. He must rescue Gamzee, who she insists deserves to begin his redemption arc immediately. John reluctantly does so, retrieving him from the final moments before the events of S. Collide. Back on Earth-C, Gamzee is set free from the fridge and declares his redemption arc begun. He claims that every bad thing he had ever done was simply due to extenuating circumstances beyond his control. Roxy and Calliope are taken in by this transparent bullshit. Not buying this foolishness for a second, John texts Terezi out in the furthest ring. The two privately dunk on Gamzee, who begins attracting the attention of civilians with his performative contrition. John's decision not to validate the truth of canon does not go unnoticed. Dirk, as his ascended self, is shaken by this profound undermining of his own narrative significance. He calls Jane, tells her to cancel her presidential bid, and goes off the grid. Jane visits Jake at his mansion, where he has been getting drunk and shooting things. They discuss Dirk's strange behavior and sudden disappearance. As Jane joins in with Jake's day drinking, she attempts to seduce him but is ignored. Not to be denied, she resorts to using the terrible power of the trickster lollipop. The two sleep together. When they come to, Jake is alarmed by his lack of consent in the matter. Jane manages to talk him into a committed relationship. Rose wakes up, miraculously recovered from her illness. She and Kanaya renew their vows of love to one another. Soon after, they visit the brooding caverns and find a newly hatched grub which bears a striking resemblance to Vriska Circuit. Rose and Kanaya decide to adopt this grub and name her Vriska Mariam Lalonde, Vriska ML for short. Jade gives the news of Jane's political withdrawal to Dave and Karkat. They all agree that this is a welcome development. Jade proceeds to aggressively flirt with Dave and Karkat. They both agree that this is a very unwelcome development. She then drags the two of them out on a date, pressuring their feelings even further. Eventually it becomes unbearable. Karkat throws a tantrum, and Dave simply fucks off. John and Roxy go on a coffee date. Gamzee soon interferes, offering to act as John's wingman while Roxy is in the bathroom. 
John is naturally disgusted by this. Gamzee leaves and John surreptitiously texts Terezi about it until Roxy returns. Dave then interrupts, taking John outside and asking for advice on handling his relationship with Jade and Carcat. John can't give him a satisfying answer. Dave decides he needs to talk to his bro and goes to his studio. There he finds Gamzee, as well as a note left by Dirk. Dave's worst fears are realized as Dirk kills himself by hanging in public, his death automatically proving just due to his self-hatred. At Dirk's funeral, Dave gives a conflicted but heartfelt speech which Gamzee immediately defiles with his own eulogy. John leaves in disgust right on time to interrupt a crucial moment of intimacy between Dave and Carcat outside. John offers to retcon Dirk's death, but Dave refuses. Once Dave and Carcat leave at Jade's call, John notices that he can't seem to use his retcon powers at all. Roxy comes outside and proposes to John, which he accepts. John texts Terezi, but a time flow difference between the interior of the black hole and the furthest ring outside it results in them speaking again six months after the wedding takes place. John reveals Roxy is now pregnant with their first child. In the meantime, Jade's relationship with Dave and Carcat has not been going well. Jane's bizarre three-way with Jake and Gamzee is even worse. Unaware that he is speaking to Terezi from inside the black hole, John tries to convince her to return to Earth C. She refuses. Three months later, John and a heavily pregnant Roxy visit Rose and Kanaya. John becomes confused when it appears that none of his friends remember the true course of canonical events. Rose, in particular, does not seem to recall pressuring him into fighting Lord English at all. He continues to message Terezi in secret, her presence seeming to be the only real thing in his life. Jane and Gamzee's relationship takes a turn for the Collegianists. Jake, who had been caring for his and Jane's biological son, Tavros Crocker, leaves the room. Gamzee's amorous honks follow him out as he calls Jade and has a short, sad conversation about their respective futures. Swept up in the baby-making spree, Jade tries to pressure Dave and Carcat into having kids between the three of them. They are characteristically recalcitrant. Their discussion is interrupted by the sudden arrival of the corpse of Teen Jade, who fell into the black hole in the meat timeline. Jade immediately takes her alternate self's body to Jane, but Jane cannot heal her, noting with frustration that she doesn't seem quite dead. The event has brought everyone together though, and Roxy tries to capitalize on the opportunity by suggesting another funeral. The sudden proximity inflames the political situation though, with Karkat and Kanaya publicly opposing Jane's machinations. Karkat expresses his anger as Jade does not take his side in the face of Jane's flagrant xenophobia. He delivers a damning speech and then leaves, breaking off his relationship with Jade and Dave in the process. The funeral for teen Jade happens in spite of this setback. During the proceedings, Aradia and Solix inexplicably show up. Roxy's speech is cut short by going into labor. John races her to the hospital and Callie moves to follow, but gets distracted by the sudden reanimation of Teen Jade's corpse. The body wakes up claiming to be the alternate version of Calliope who destroyed the Green Sun. She now exists as the consciousness of the black hole that devoured it, channeled through Jade's body. She says she has come here to protect their world and prepare to challenge Dirk, who is simultaneously assuming control of events outside the black hole's event horizon. Events begin to accelerate. Three years in the future, Terezi messages John on the third birthday of his son, Harry Anderson Egbert. John fills Terezi in on the current state of events, which have rapidly begun to deteriorate. Troll ghosts who were sucked into the black hole have begun falling from the sky en masse. Jane is using her business to lobby the government into instituting more and more totalitarian controls on the troll population. Karkat has established a rebel faction. The rebellion basically sucks until Mina shows up wearing the Ring of Life, which she stole from John. She agrees to be Karkat's second in command and starts whipping the resistance into shape. Gamzee has started performing public redemptions featuring sloppy makeouts and baby bottles full of Jane's breast milk. Worried about Tavros Crocker's abusive home life, John plans to kidnap him. He puts this plan into action during Harry's fifth birthday party, held at Jane's Manor. He manages to get Tavros into his bedroom where they can escape out the window, but gets interrupted by Jade. The two of them argue loudly enough to alert the rest of their friends. John and Jane have a confrontation that culminates in John losing control of the windy thing. He leaves the party in disgrace. Terezi texts him, and the two open up about their existential despair. Terezi admits that she's dying of starvation, but can't bring herself to give up searching for Vriska. Their conversation ends with Terezi saying she wanted to give John closure. John is worried about the implications of his continuing involvement with Terezi, and flies around until his dad's car crashes through the sky. 
Noticing Terezi's blood all over the back seat from their hate fuck session in Meat, John mistakenly takes this to mean that she is dead. This leads to an existential tantrum so intense it forces the narrative to skip 10 years. Harry Anderson is now a shitty teen and dating the slightly less shitty Vriska Miriam Lalonde, who is in a collisionous relationship with Tavros Crocker. They consider running away from home and joining Carcat's Rebellion together because things are so fucked. John himself is now epically divorced. He attends Jade and Dave's wedding where he meets Carcat. He considers joining Carcat's Rebellion but decides against it because he thinks he'd be too sad and useless. Carcat flees to avoid meeting Dave, who comes outside to talk to his best friend. John throws away the selfie he asked Terezi to take ten years ago, making peace with the idea that nothing matters anymore. The original Vriska, sucked into the black hole during the battle against Lord English, drops in from the sky. She's alive, and she's pissed. Alternate Calliope spots Ellie's own entrance into the black hole and moves to intercept him. Jake informs Jane her father has died protecting the president from an assassination attempt by Karkat's rebellion. Jane launches a full-scale war to kill Karkat, and when Gamzee objects to her xenophobic rhetoric, she kicks him out of her life and off her imperial warship. Friska, now dubbed Vriska in parentheses, hates the inconsequential reality she finds herself in and wants to return to canon immediately. They're interrupted by Gamzee, who tries to manipulate Vriska into a sexual relationship in the name of, quote, redemption. She delivers a righteous and savage beatdown, but the clown's disgusting wiles have the desired effect. The two hate smooch behind some bushes. Rose and Kanaya arrive, themselves now important rebellion figures. John is distracted from the horrific clownery by Rose, who thanks him for making the choice that put them on this path. She no longer cares if this reality is true, relevant, or essential, and is enjoying the simple happiness of loving her wife and daughter. Vriska Miriam Lalonde discovers her namesake in the bushes with Gamzee. Vriska Parenthetical freaks out. Gamzee tries to manipulate her some more, implying that somehow she took advantage of him, despite their age difference. She kills him, and the two Vriskas acquaint themselves. Vriska ML reveals that she stole John's phone. They read his conversations with Terezi, and after divulging her long-standing and complex romantic feelings for her fellow Scourge sister, Vriska Parenthetical sends Terezi a message. John returns to his father's house, where he discovers Jake and Tavros, who have fled the Crocker household. Jake and John have a heart-to-heart. Jake convinces John to reach out to Roxy and Harry Anderson. John meets Roxy at their old house. John believes that his actions have doomed everyone to insignificance. Roxy decries this self-important nonsense and opens up to him about her feelings about their marriage, gender, and childbirth. When Harry Anderson arrives home, John asks him if he'd like to go for a drive. Harry agrees. Dave and Jade, now working for Carcat's Rebellion, work far from the front line excavating ancient Earth artifacts. They get separated, and Dave finds his way inside the ruins of the Oval Office. There, he finds a transportalizer that leads him to a chamber with a Hero of Hope outfit and a holographic projection of Barack Obama, who addresses him directly. Dave talks to his hero about his sexuality. Obama comforts him before convincing him to ascend to his ultimate self and enter the robot body Dirk had apparently prepared for him some time before. The dead cherub, still inhabiting Teen Jade's body, explains to Aradia that their reality, being composed of stories, is open to manipulation by any agent powerful enough to assume the role of narrator. Such manipulation may only become apparent in hindsight, casting into doubt the neutrality of all events prior, and hence undermining the very integrity of the story in which they live. This is, she reveals, what Dirk has been up to outside of the event horizon. The dead cherub then kills and devours Lord English. By doing so, she attains heights of power heretofore unmatched. She punches a wormhole in the fabric of the black hole, allowing a brief window of escape from its gravitational well. Davebot arrives. The Cherub, Davebot, and Aradia leave through the portal in pursuit of the prince. Welcome back to those who experienced the time skip, and thank you for listening if that was the path you chose. Although that summary did run long, I promise it's essential to understanding certain story beats in Homestuck Beyond Canon, and why certain events play out as they have. The newly introduced characters, our new villains, and of course, both versions of the main cast are vitally important to the HSBC plot, and the events pick up seemingly right where the epilogues leave off. If you're eager to jump directly to the newest HSBC content, I will now also summarize the events of the sequel so far. 
Hopefully this is helpful both for new readers and for those who need a refresher on this content as well. Once again, here's the timestamp to go to to skip this if you wish. Introduction Somewhere, in the distant reaches of space, Ultimate Dirk sulks in his private study on board Theseus, the ship he has taken from Jake and renamed. He rambles directly to the reader about getting the story of Homestuck back on track, when he is interrupted by his compatriots, Rosebot and Terezi. Rose quips about becoming a robot and informs Dirk that they are nearing their intended destination, and that Jake has failed to install landing gear on the ship. Dirk continues to address the reader, stating that at certain points the extended narrative prose of the epilogues will continue as he sees fit, telling us not to worry because he is an excellent ho- oh, wait. That's a phrase with some problematic history. He then turns the narrative text back to its normal color and, for the first time in years, reopens the command suggestion box, letting the readers decide what he does next. The next command reads, Dirk, stop making Homestuck. He wordlessly slashes the command to bits and continues on his own in the style of a classic Homestuck introduction page. However, he soon realizes that Terezi is at the command terminal and is influencing him. They agree to continue this for a few pages until Dirk begins narrating again, explaining that this narration will be called a prattle going forward and can effectively replace panels if needed. Terezi then notes that the ship is equipped with ectobiology equipment, and in the same room is a large MacGuffin under a sheet. Not a magic one, just a standard MacGuffin. Rose voices some concerns about their mission, and Dirk reveals that they are to intercept a budding planet's future suburb session. The Theseus crashes down. Chapter 1. Ghost Flusters We zoom in on Jake English, working away in a garden outside of John's house. Jake and his son Tavros have been living with John after leaving Jane. Jake partakes in some liquor left out by John, and dreams he is back on his island on his Earth. As he runs through the jungle from an unseen monster, Brain Ghost Dirk swoops him into a tree for a chat. He is a distinctly different Dirk than the one we just left, and eventually pushes Jake to his doom, waking him. To Jake's surprise, Brain Ghost Dirk is still present in John's kitchen, a manifestation of his own mind. He convinces Jake to become a spy for the Resistance against Jane, and we see them boarding her Crocker Corp battleship. Jake listens to Jane cry about how the opposition has kidnapped Tavros, and she reveals her battle plans to him before leaving him alone again. Jake and Brain Ghost Dirk discuss whether or not this is a good idea and come to the conclusion that being a hero is bigger than any of them individually. Chapter 2 Clown Logistics Minutes in the past, but not many. Vriska and Vrissi lean up against Gamzee's fresh corpse and shoot the shit. Vriska gives Vrissi her nickname, shedding the mimetic parentheses around her name. They need to hide the body of the recently deceased beloved religious figurehead, so Vrissi calls Tavros and tells him to drive over. The three of them stuff Gamzee's body in the trunk of his hover car, and Vrissi calls Harry Anderson for help hiding the body. The three of them arrive at a human kingdom school and heave the clown corpse through the halls, where his huge honking clown ass gets caught on a fire sprinkler and sets off the whole system. Suddenly, the hall is filled with students taking pictures of the scene, and the three hooligans run to a janitor's closet. Jane very quickly catches wind of the incident and comes to the conclusion that the Vriskas must have kidnapped Tavros and forced him into this, leading to her earlier, later conversation with Jake. Harry Anderson, sitting outside on the bleachers, also soon sees his friends with Gamzee's corpse on social media, and remarks, Ah, oh, fuck. Chapter 3. How are your feelings? We now swap over to the meat timeline, in which another of Jake's more stupid-looking ships hurtles through space. Alt Calliope, inhabiting Jade's body, floats into Dave and Carcat's room in the middle of the night to warn them about Dirk's growing influence. They are not amused at her intrusion, but are now awake, so they go to make coffee and meet Roxy, who is he-him in this timeline, in the kitchen. Dave departs to go find Kanaya on the observation deck, and they discuss their mission and how Kanaya misses her wife. They have a feelings jam in the star pile. Kanaya tells a story that she and Rose used to tell the Wrigglers, about a prince who loved a flower, and how he lost it. The prince failed to cherish the flower while he had her, and in his journey to get her back, he discovers what she had meant to him all along. Meanwhile, Carcat and Roxy get up to the same sort of feelings jam. Carcat and Dave both separately discuss how, despite everything, they've ended up exactly where they need to be, with each other. Chapter 4, The Contest Light years away, we see the crash landing site of Theseus. Dirk, Rosebot, and Terezi are huddled with their supplies in a cave. 
Terezi tires of the other two's philosophizing and fucks off to explore the new planet, Deltritis. Rose and Dirk discuss their plan to create intelligent life on this planet and direct it towards playing suburb. Rose questions the morality of this, but is won over, read, influenced, by Dirk. He then proposes a contest to Rose. They are both to create an alien species and culture. They will go to war, and the victor will play suburb. To do this, Dirk unveils the MacGuffin from earlier, a hybrid alchemiter and ectobiology lab. They will use their own paradox slime to alchemize other matter onto and invent a new species in a process called alchemical biology. Dirk then takes his first swing at creating life and makes a small tentacled spiky monster in a flower pot. Chapter 5. Your eyes have been closed. Rosebot leaves Dirk to work on his species in the cave and wanders off to find Terezi in the ruins of Theseus's crash site. Terezi is watching over Rose's comatose body, which is hooked up to wires and tubes keeping it alive. Terezi and Rose discuss their opinions of Dirk and their plan to veer back into canon relevance. Terezi morally disapproves, and Rose attempts to explain to her why it is necessary for them to intervene. This veers into Rose diagnosing Terezi's depression. Terezi bites back by suggesting that Rose abandoned Kanaya and is under Dirk's influence. Rose begins to mention a certain someone from Terezi's past that she abandoned, and this is the tipping point for them both. They begin to brawl with each other, seemingly cooking up a kismet vicissitude. Right as we get to the good part, Dirk's narration interrupts, wanting us to get back to the, quote, real story. Terezi can, as she always could, hear this narration. Dirk goes back to work on his species. Chapter 6, A Conversation Regarding Relevance Alt Calliope takes hold of the narration for this chapter. She waxes poetic about the vastness of space and how many beings would never truly experience it, nor understand just how large and empty it really is. She is soon interrupted by Jade the very same jade whose body she is inhabiting. They quibble in an internal dialogue about Calliope's takeover of Jade's body and how she makes decisions for Jade against her will, such as drinking pulpy orange juice. We find that Jade is trapped in her own mind, unable to act on her own free will. She is confused about Calliope's insistence to address the audience, as Jade has not reached ultimate selfhood and doesn't grasp the concept. She is, however, awake and fully conscious in her own mind, much to Calliope's surprise. They discuss how Jade was the only suitable host for Callie, as she is a space player close in power to Callie herself, and because Jade is already used to narrative hardships, as she has often been a plot device to move things along. The statement of this fact, of course, is simply just Callie attempting to hold influence over Jade. Callie continues to tell Jade how her capriciousness and frivolity make her untrustworthy, and Jade takes great offense to this. She tackles Alt Calliope, allowing her to momentarily take control of her body and grab a, quote, Rice's cup off of the counter, threatening Callie with the famous Harlinglish Crockerbert peanut allergy. Could killing Alt Calliope be just? Would Jade be heroic to do it? Before anyone has the chance to find out, Callie releases her grip on Jade's consciousness, returning to the void where she resides, and leaving Jade flabbergasted in the kitchen. Chapter 7. Distress Call from the Closet Back at school, Vrissy gets a call from Harry Anderson while in the broom closet. He apologizes for not believing she was serious about heaving a circus corpse into the trunk of her Kismasis' car. They agree to meet up at Harry Anderson's mom's house. Yes, that is Roxy Lalonde. The other three decide to leave Clown Messiah to rot forever in a stinky janitor's closet where he belongs. The scene shifts to a raging battlefield. Commander Carcat Vantis and General Mina Pikesies share a brief policy discussion amidst the chaos when the beloved Swiffer Egg Mop, first seen in the epilogues in the Brood Caverns unmentioned in our summary, approaches with news of Gamzee's demise. Carcat, however, sees a different danger in this news. Friska's return. Jane has also named Carcat as the mastermind behind the assassination. In response, Carcat plans something he considers ridiculous. He is going to seek out John Egbert. Harry Anderson arrives at his mother's house before the other three. However, both of his parents are home. They proceed to have a conversation that we see take place in the epilogues, the one ending with John offering to take Harry Anderson for a drive. The other three arrive and hide in the bushes outside. Harry Anderson goes for a drive with John, and Roxy leaves to get him some snacks for when he returns. The other kids all scramble inside, and the audience gets to see Harry Anderson's room, with the narration noting how much of a theater kid he is. Frissy comments on how the human who took their picture at the school is a very good photographer. This is a fact to remember for the bonus content. Soon, Harry Anderson arrives back home, and John takes a rest on the couch back at his house. Carcat calls him and tells him to turn on the news. Upon seeing what his son's friends have been up to, he is overjoyed. He tells Carcat that this could be just the thing they've needed to win against Jane. 
Chapter 8, A Daughter Astray On the Crocker Court battleship, Jane, Jake, and Brain Ghost Dirk watch the news unfold on TV in real time. A crowd has amassed outside of Roxy's house. Harry Anderson, now dubbed Harry by Vriska, begins to talk with her about his father's past and how his youthful adventures have never seemed real until she showed up. At the same time, Vrissy and Tavros talk about how Vrissy is getting jealous of Vriska after she cannonballed out of the sky and started doing a whole bunch of cool shit immediately. John calls Harry and lets him know that he is proud of him and his friends, treating the whole clown-killing incident like a prank. They make plans to meet at the bell tower where Dirk famously killed himself, and John warns Harry not to get caught, as Jane's secret police are likely outside with the news reporters. Meanwhile, high above the clouds, we see Rose and Kanaya standing at the helm of their resistance battleship. They are incredibly worried about the safety of their daughter, Vrissy, and her friends. While they're attempting to form a game plan to make sure she's safe, Jade bursts into the control room. She is missing the other half of her scouting party, Dave Strider. She stifles her tears and tells the two admirals that Yiffy has been kidnapped. Kanaya is visibly confused, as are the readers. Who is Yiffy? Jade and Rose begin to explain, but we are whisked back down to Earthsea in Roxy's living room. Harry, Vrissy, and Tavros all bicker about their chances of escape and their familial issues, until Vriska shuts them all up. She scolds them for how pathetic all of them are being, and hands Harry a Strife Specibus to arm himself with. He allocates the Strife Specibus with the scissor kind of Stratus, meaning he will use his sewing scissors as a weapon. Harry, much like his father before him, has a fleeting feeling that it is going to be a long day. He rejoins the rest of the crew just in time for Vriska to confidently walk right out the front door. All the reporters turn to her, and she denounces the entirety of Earthsea, claiming that she is the creator they never knew they had, and that she is indeed a terrorist intending to take the world by storm and shape it into a place worth living. A bullet grazes her shoulder. Vriska is furious. Her god-tier outfit materializes onto her. She begins knocking out reporters as bullets begin whizzing by. She rolls her fluorite octet, and with their strength, she picks up Roxy's car and hurls it into the air. The dice land, and a fleet of naval cannons materialize behind her. The cannons fire, and the car explodes into a fireball of smoking debris raining down upon the would-be assassins. Vriska, Harry, Tavros, and Vrissy begin their escape, racing towards the bell tower. At the top, Vriska and John finally reunite, with John in his old and ill-fitting god-tier garb. They are soon joined by Rose, Jade, and Kanaya as well. The reunion quickly turns serious as Jade recounts a secret she's held for years. She has a daughter. She has had a daughter for 15 years. Jade, seeing all of her friends pair off and start lives together, desperately wanted something like this for herself. But as we know, her romance with Dave and Carcat did not pan out well. Carcat left and Jade stayed with Dave because she didn't want him to feel alone after Dirk's death. However, although she longed for a family, she was unable to conceive a child. She turned to Rose as a surrogate, and Rose agreed to carry Jade's child, without informing Kanaya. This revelation, of course, also canonizes Jade's below-the-belt anatomy, let's call it. Rose and Jade kept Yiffany Longstocking Lalonde Harley a secret for 15 years, and now she's been kidnapped as a political refugee by Jane. The gang all retreat to the battleship to rest and plan her escape. It takes this long for John to absentmindedly inquire about Dave's whereabouts. Chapter 9. How goes the eulogizing, dear? On her battleship, Jane is deep in the throes of writing a heartfelt clown eulogy. This proves to be difficult as she absolutely hated his guts. Jake enters with coffee for her and a dog bowl of mac and cheese for their prisoner. He then leaves Jane to finish her work. Yiffy throws her bowl of food at Jane's monitor, portraying a close-up of a clown's dead face. Yiffy takes a fearsome stance and growls at Jane threateningly. Jane responds by activating a shock collar that she has adorned her prisoner with. She reveals that Yiffy was enrolled at an academy she oversees as a favor to Rose and Jade. With Yiffy unconscious, Jane leaves to prepare for the funeral tomorrow. On the battleship, Harry, Vrissy, and Tavros can't sleep, and talk about the strange group dynamic of the adults. Harry saw John, Rose, and Jade discussing something in hushed tones with Kanaya, and finds it odd that Dave isn't present. Tavros notes that Kanaya seemed very angry at the bell tower. Frissy very abruptly succumbs to sleep. Harry asks Tavros what it's like to have known someone who died. Chapter 10. I wonder what they taste like. 
Terezi awakes from a nap on the Deltritis grass. She begins narrating about Deltritis plant life, and soon encounters a spider-like insect clearly alchemobiologized by a spider, Rose's Needles, a Recuper Raccoon, and the Con Air Bunny. As she traverses the terrain, we see more creatures of this kind, including a Fidu Spawn plush with Charles Dutton's face, and a horse crossed with what seems to be an Alternian drone, among others. Terezi is soon accosted by one of the beasts, which grasps her in its tentacly vines, but Rose stops the beast from ending her in its equine maw at the last second with the command console. Terezi begins to discuss with Rose how she and Dirk seem to be doomed to repeat history, but Dirk interrupts and has Rose see to other matters, to Terezi's chagrin. Terezi then goads Dirk on, trying to get him to admit that he brought Rose along to hold himself back from experimenting too far. Terezi posits that Rose will instead be the one to go too far, and that Dirk has underestimated her and is the one holding her back. Dirk realizes that the two of them will likely have to scrap their work and start over. Chapter 11. History's Most Notorious Haters We jump to another spaceship hurtling through space. Aboard are Aradia and Dave Bot. Davebot now contains Dave's ultimate self, and for him, this means that he simultaneously experiences all points in time at once, all the time. Dave begins rapping and subconsciously starts to reveal his feelings about leaving his wife and friends behind. Aradia also realizes that she left Solix behind. There is a brief flashback to the black hole that Aradia, Davebot, and Calliope left Earth-C through, and Solix laments how he will get down from the roof he is left on. Back in the present, Aradia continues to prod Dave about how he really feels leaving everyone behind, suggesting that he is projecting onto her. They quickly drop the subject, as they are joined by Teenage Jade's corpse, now inhabited by Alt Calliope. It is shown that all the narration in this chapter is spoken aloud by her. She is displeased with how unserious Dave and Aradia seem to be about their mission. Dave wants to talk about Kanaya in huge jorts. The reader hopes to God that this is plot relevant later. Weeks pass on their journey. The three have a strange camaraderie among them now. Calliope willingly jokes with Aradia and pokes fun at Davebot. Aradia reveals that she is hundreds of years old, having spent ages in doomed timelines, reappearing before anyone realized she was gone. At the end of this chapter, Calliope is struck by something unseen, presumably from another narrative, and collapses. Chapter 12. Really convoluted metaphorical horse shit. We jump to the other ship containing a jade body taken over by Calliope. The one with Roxy, Dave, Karkat, and Kanaya on board. Dave and Karkat are in the laundry room, and Dave is mumbling about Kanaya's fairy tale from earlier, trying to figure out who the flower is. They discuss how Kanaya internalized the story's themes and related it to how she misses Rose, and Dave admits that he is now projecting his feelings on top of that interpretation. Really convoluted, metaphorical horseshit. What this boils down to is Dave telling Karkat that he is struggling to find meaning in what they are doing and is terrified of the future. He deflects these feelings with, surprise, ironic jokes. He comes clean, however, with his feelings for fear for Rose and John's well-being, as well as his anger and sadness about Dirk. He then pivots to a topic that brings him a lot of stress, Karkat's mortality. All of their peers have some form of immortality except for Karkat. He assuages Dave's fears and tells him that what he's feeling is valid and Dirk's narrative turn is not at all Dave's fault. And, as for his mortality, he is the happiest he has ever been in his life when spending time with Dave on this voyage. They're where they need to be. They have each other. They kiss. Chapter 13, The Funeral. We see a chapel overrun with grieving citizens and news outlets. Jane Crocker gives a eulogy fit for Pagliacci. Jake, Brain Ghost Dirk, and Yiffy all stand off to the side, with Yiffy on a leash held by Jake. The two of them lock eyes, and Jake releases his grasp. She scrambles atop Gamzee's coffin and begins furiously stomping on it. Without missing a beat in her speech, Jane violently shocks Yiffy over and over. Jake talks to Brain Ghost Dirk about how he lowered the voltage on the collar, but Jane seems intent on continuing to shock Yiffy until she is no more. Yiffy, however, overcomes the pain and kicks the clown directly out of the clown box, with him landing between the chapel pews, ass pointing straight to the mirthful messiahs, just ripe for kicking. Yiffany takes advantage of this. She then jumps right up to Jane's podium, growling, and swipes the remote out of her hand, before doing an acrobatic fucking pirouette into the crowd, giving Gamzee's corpse one last kick before her escape. The narrative assures us that this is truly the last we will ever have to see of him. Jake watches Yiffy's actions in awe, hoping to eventually make up for lost time with his granddaughter. Behind Jane, the stained glass window of the chapel shatters. The war has come to her. Chapter 14. The Best Laid Plans 
Back at Roxy's house, John talks to Harry while the Vriskas bicker. John and Harry discuss how it's nice to spend time together and be a part of something bigger, even though it seems like they've been sidelined for the time being. John mentions that he had a great plan, but that Carcat told him he isn't well versed enough in battle strategy for it to work. Friska, meanwhile, is furious about the fact that she specifically has been sidelined, and regales Vrissi with her tales of leadership leading up to the final battle of Suburb. Vrissi then reveals that Vriska, for all intents and purposes, has mostly been left out of Earthsea's history of the session, which only serves to infuriate her more. John offers them snacks to calm her down and goes back to showing Harry his plan, which is indeed shit. The Vriskas abruptly leave. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Yiffy is reunited with her loving mother and mother. Jane approaches with armed guards and threatens to arrest all three of them. Jade tells her to look up. On their ship, Kanaya is poised to bite Tavros's neck. When it is pointed out that this isn't how troll vampirism works, she instead threatens to break his neck. Jane hesitates. Just as she is about to make the call, Jake rushes through the crowd, calling out to his son. Jane, who almost certainly was about to give the kill command, instead tells her troops to stand down, and orders the rebels out of her sight. The Vriskas are trampling through dense forest, and Rissy envies Tavros' situation as bait for Jane over whatever adventure she is on. Vriska soon reveals to her that the plan is to do a hard reset on reality. She is disappointed with the earth that all her peers created. She wants to set into action another suburb session. They are accosted by a small army of Jane's soldiers, but the two are ready for a fight. Vrissi reveals her weapon of choice, a flail with two large D8 on either end. Jane's battleship flies overhead. John follows it, low to the ground, as it passes various landmarks. It soon approaches his own home. A single bomb drops from the hull. John's childhood home goes up in smoke and flame. John sits and watches it turn to ash. Dusk falls. Commander Carcat joins his old friend. He begins to tell John of what else has unfurled today, including the capture of two Vriskas. John finds this troublesome, as Vriska's psycho-manipulative abilities should have prevented her capture, but instead she is doing time with her descendant. Carcat goes on to chastise John for his adolescent perception of the entire Earthsea political situation. John is so hung up on becoming relevant again that he is failing to see things crumble around him. He just barely comes to this realization before shifting the conversation to talk about how Carcat feels about Dave. Carcat once again berates John for even bringing up the subject before asking where Dave even is. He continues to rant as John realizes that Carcat hasn't heard the news yet. Dave is dead. Carcat is speechless. Chapter 15. Okay, so there's this flower. On a ship in another timeline, Roxy sits Dave down for a chat. He and Carcat have been sharing a bit too much PDA and it's making people a little uncomfortable. Specifically Roxy, who is revealed to have been in the laundry room the last time we saw this ship. They do a lot of nonsensical back and forth as the Strylons are wont to do. Roxy then asks about what the plan is when they inevitably catch Dirk. Dave posits that maybe they should wait to figure that out until the moment they need to, and brings up the flower story again. Although this time he posits that maybe assigning metatextual meaning to something does not make it more important. Roxy sees him trying to deflect, and asks Dave if he can kill Dirk should it come to that. They are interrupted by Carcat screaming, and Dave explains that he has been finding piles of meat left for him by Callie, and that they've been freaking him out. We see Callie's eyes peeking out of a vent at Carcat. Chapter 16. Welcome to my secret lair. Dawn on Earth C. John is still standing at the rubble left behind by the bomb. Carcat has left, but they shared some quiet time together before he did. Roxy texts John and asks him for a favor. He flies back to her house and she invites him in for a rest before the favor, which he mistakes as an invitation for intimacy. Roxy quickly shoots this idea down, relieving John. They talk about the current geopolitical situation and their evil dictator ex-friends, and how they both feel about the situation. Roxy gives John space to possibly explore his feelings about gender, but they stick a pin in that conversation. She then reveals that she has a transportalizer under her bed which provides access to a secret lab that she has had the entire time they were married. They move her bed and teleport to her sanctum, where yet another Callie is seen waiting, alongside a very large thing under a cover. Roxy reveals that they are on the old meteor, and Callie begins to let John in on the secret her and Roxy have brought him here for. Callie explains that Earth C exists inside of the black hole that destroyed the Green Sun, the singularity of which happens to be the very lab that they are in, and that John's decision to eat candy instead of meat at their picnic decades ago is what indirectly cemented this. 
he did not go back to fight Lord English in this timeline, so the black hole was created. If he had, the events of Meet would have played out instead. Callie explains that both existences simultaneously exist, regardless of John's choice. She goes on to say that although her alternate self escaped, there is not much anyone else can do to get out of a black hole. They can't go on living here because nothing matters at all, and the world is on the brink of cataclysm. They are trapped inside a black hole, unable to access anything outside of it, rendering the entire timeline moot. As Callie puts it, Because nothing in here matters, we are likely to be subjected to things which are a bit mm, bats in the belfry, for no reason other than it's totally insignificant to the wider canon of reality. And much though I am personally titillated by some of the consequences of this predicament, it is a degrading way for us to live. It is then revealed what John's place in the plan is. He has to bust Friska out of jail and bring her to the Singularity. The Singularity that Callie and Roxy have decided to call the Plot Point. Beyond Canon The first page in years. Homestuck 2 has become Homestuck Beyond Canon. Terezi embarks on a courtroom drama against herself before deciding that it is incredibly stupid. We see her lying in the grass, seemingly directly addressing the audience. She laments that she may be in a rut and depressed. She knows that she is to be the judge of Rose and Dirk's contest, but this idea just doesn't excite her as it once would have. She kicks one of their hideous creations into the atmosphere. Dirk begins pestering her and shares the final mock-up of his species, satyrs, with her. She says it tastes like horse shit. Dirk begins narrating again, but Terezi interrupts him, seemingly fully aware of what he can do now. She looks happily at the old, beat-up wallet modus she has, insisting that she writes her own story and intends to get it right. We then see a very quick scene tying up a loose end from way earlier. Davebot and Aradia look on, not knowing what to think, as teenage Jade's body now lies lifeless on the floor. Alt Calliope has seemingly been forced out. Back in Roxy's secret lab, John investigates a noise he heard just before leaving. It is revealed to be Solix, eating a sandwich and playing Donkey Kong Country. He insults John until he leaves, but also tells him that his words don't matter, only his actions. He then asks John to change his game for him. We shift scenes to the Vriskas, who are in prison. Vriska wants to test Vrissi's mettle to get them out of this situation. They begin a parody of Jailbreak, with Vriska Prime being the pumpkin. We also see some previously unknown chum handles on Vrissi's phone. Vrissi mind controls the guard outside to open their cell door. They begin their escape, and Vriska discusses the narrative realness of this universe, calling Vrissi an imitation. Vrissi abandons her in favor of doing her own thing, and she makes a speedy escape into the back of a Crocker Corp supply truck. Vriska, on the other hand, snoops through the vents of the facility and sees a broadcast from Jane to her troops. She debriefs that a wiretap on John's phone has revealed Roxy and Callie's plan, and she spins it in such a way that the plot point is some sort of weapon, meant to be piloted by Vriska. She ends off the debrief with a call to action. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to the point. And that, dear viewer, brings us to the most recent HSBC update as of writing this script. By the time this video comes out, there may be more. In fact, there is more, because more was posted as I'm recording this. Editing takes a long time, you must understand. But wait, there's more! As a part of the original Homestuck 2 Patreon, certain bonus stories were published in addition to the regular pages of the comic. These feature stories within the same universe with less canonical relevance. They are as follows. Catnapped. As Jane is being sworn in as president of Earth-C in the meat timeline, Jake watches on in the crowd, joined by Brain Ghost Dirk. Jane suddenly disappears in a smokescreen of magical dust and pyrotechnics. It is soon revealed that she has been captured by Jaspero Sprite Squared and whisked off to the Carapacian Kingdom, where she is put under house arrest as Jaspero's claims her election was undemocratic, as Jane is in no shape to hold any government office. Jaspero's intends to train her in three pillars of government, women, wine, and song. She then conjures a fenestrated plane and sends herself, Jane, Jake, Swiffer Eggmop, Clipper Borden, and a Carapacian monarchist through it. Inexplicably, we are suddenly in Problem Sleuth Squared. P.S. looks out of his window and notices a purplish flash of light at a local bar. This is the group reappearing. Swiffer and Clipper discuss how Jaspero's keeping Jane occupied is good for the sake of their race's continuation on Earthsea, and Jaspero's asks Jane if she notices anything different since Dirk's departure. Meanwhile, Dad Crocker discovers the fenestrated plane and heaves it up, jumping through it himself in search of his daughter. Back at the bar, Jane and Jaspero's dance. 
Jaspros explains that in order to gain her approval, Jane must win the election fair and square, with no outside help from Dirk or anyone. She then passes by Hysterical Dame and Nervous Broad, who are on their honeymoon, on her way to talk to Jake. She asks him to run against Jane, which he quickly declines outright and has another drink. She then turns to the trolls, offering the opportunity to run against Jane to Swiffer instead. She begins to think it over, and Jaspros looks out into the street, only to notice Dad Crocker approaching, inexplicably handcuffed to Diamond's Droog of all people, uh, carapaces. Jaspros produces another portal and orders everyone in. The final panel of this bonus story switches back to P.S., still stuck in his office. To be continued? A Treatise on Representational Democracy we see a book by the same name as this bonus story, with the subtitle A Picture Book for Young Parliamentarians. The book is revealed to be the story of the mayor, and quickly retells his history in Homestuck proper. However, it then dissolves into an explanation of how the government was established on Earth Sea, parodying the explanation of troll romance. The main legislative branch consists of a house of elected seats with representations from each of the four kingdoms. Seats were awarded based on voter turnout, and each kingdom has a set number of seats they could fill. If 50% of a population voted, they would receive 50% of their respective seats. This makes it very hard for any one kingdom to gain a majority in the house, meaning collaborative governing was often on the table. The house quickly also established many house rules to dictate and guide their governance. The House wrote the laws, but the responsibility for interpreting and enforcing them falls upon the Delivery of Justice, or DOJ for short. They are the peacekeepers and adjudicators in all legal matters. They also deliver the mail. They are overseen by the Postal Minister and consist of legal scholars and delivery workers. Their court system is described as justice by mail, and bail is to be paid in postage. The DOJ eventually also became responsible for infrastructure, housing, work and pensions, diplomacy, welfare, etc. through ensuring a just and equitable society. They also established the Parcel Luggers Union, or PLU, to ensure fair treatment within their ranks as well. This branch was often more complex than the House, with many within its ranks calling for multiple reforms and reorganizations, none of which found much success. The third, and perhaps most crucial, branch is the mayor's office. The title of mayor fell to a democratically elected figurehead agreed on by all four kingdoms to be the figurehead of Earthsea as a whole. Someone to look up to in times of need, someone to maintain public morale. The purpose of the mayor is to inspire the people of Earthsea to build a brighter future for themselves. This position, of course, was first held by the mayor himself. Diamonds, Dames, and Dads we find ourselves back in Midnight City, home of Problem Sleuth's office and the bar that Jaspros is throwing an impromptu campaign party at. At another, more shady establishment, Diamond's Droog is getting himself drunk, as he is currently out of work. Suddenly, a broad-shouldered human man enters the bar and sits next to him. He offers to light Droog's cigarette for him, and tells him he's looking for a broad. He pulls out a newspaper clipping of Jane Crocker, and informs Droog that she is his daughter. He recounts that another version of Droog once kept him imprisoned, and figured that maybe this version of him is looking to do some dirty work as well. Droog tells the man that he may know someone just willing to help. He pays his tab and they depart. The two gentlemen make their way to the familiar office of a man who prides himself on being a bit of a sleuth whenever there's a problem. P.S. sleuths that these gentlemen should seek out someone at a seedy hotel a few blocks away. They make their way there, bickering over mostly nothing along the way. They take the elevator to the roof and prepare to meet with the man they're looking for, Spade Slick. However, they are interrupted by a smooth, smoky voice that Droog finds familiar. Snowman. Droog's next conscious thought occurs in a room with a single swinging light bulb. He is tied to a chair next to the fatherly figure he paired up with earlier. Slick is in the corner, watching as one of his lackeys roughs Droog up. He incredulously asks why Droog is paired up with one of those out-of-towners. The other guy speaks up. He says he ain't got no skin in this game. They talk about some party going on downtown. Slick goes for his knife, but the gentleman in white kicks the back of his knee, sending him down for the count. The man flexes and surprisingly breaks his bindings, grabs Slick's knife to cut Droog free, and then picks Slick up again to dust his suit off. Instead, however, his manly brawn sends Slick directly through the drywall and into the street outside, where he proceeds to get hit by Snowman's car. Snowman tells the two of them to get in and takes him to her apartment downtown, where she tells them that they've fucked the entire timeline halfway to Tuesday. 
There was supposed to be an intermission involving the two of them and Slick, but with Slick dead, all of it is moot. We fast forward to the two gentlemen being kicked out of Snowman's van into the gravel, handcuffed together. According to Snowman, this will get the timeline back on track. Droog and his new partner share an unambiguously gay moment together while a flashing purple cat squid woman looks out of a door at them from down the street. To be continued? A threat sensed. Ultimate Dirk awakes on the floor of his cave, which is in disarray. Rosebot looks in, concerned for him. He gives her a thumbs up and returns to his computer, beginning a conversation with another orange narratorial figure. Dirk asks them if they don't think they've gone a bit too far, and reveals that for a brief moment, upon Alt Calliope, Davebot, and Aradia's exit, he can see into the post-canon singularity known as Candy, which he normally cannot do. Dirk caught a glimpse of Yiffy in that brief moment, and presses Andrew as to why she exists. He continues on to tell them that their story has gone to shit, and he is doing a better job writing it on Deltritus. They continue to talk about Yiffy, and Andrew reveals that she has spent her life thus far at Miss Paint's home for inconvenient girls. Dirk, seemingly echoing the audience, goes off a bit more about how Yiffy is stupid and seemingly irrelevant to the candy story at large. Andrew rebuts by accusing Dirk of being afraid of her. Dirk denies this outright, but we are shown that he seems to be shaken by her. To be continued... The Influencers We jump back to the scene where Harry Anderson is sitting on the bleachers. Three other human children are rendered on this page in detail. They are Silas P. Beauregard III, Avril Thorpe, and Imode Karita. The principal sends them to the office as they witness the clown crime. Imode catches a glimpse of Rissy dragging Gamzee's body into the closet on their way to the office, but says nothing. Avril notices that Jane has disliked his photo of the event, causing his follower count to skyrocket. The three of them discuss the events before their computer teacher enters the room. He suggests that they flee the scene and give the other three fugitives a fighting chance, and turn the tide of the war in the process. Imode decides to climb out the window. Avril and Silas follow them. Once they have gotten a safe distance from the school, the three of them see John flying up to the bell tower. Avril, due to his urban exploration exploits, has a key to the tower and unlocks it. However, they see Tavros, Harry, and the Vriskas approaching, so they make themselves scarce. The influencers, exhausted from influencing the main story, reconvene at a coffee shop. It is revealed that they hid in a bush for the entirety of the bell tower scene, hearing everything that the main cast spoke about. The three of them talk about their connections to the main cast. Imode is in Drama Club with Harry Anderson, and Silas is acquainted with Tavros, as both of their families are members of high society. Suddenly, there is a loud explosion outside, followed by another. Their troll waitress, Ruthie, tells them that they should probably get going if they don't want to die. To be continued. And that wraps up HSBC bonus content as well. At this point, if you've watched the whole video, you should ideally be completely out of the dark regarding the happenings of post canon. However, just to recap, here are the last known locations of the main cast. In the meat timeline, Dirk, Terezi, and Rosebot have landed on Deltritus and are beginning to create life there. John's corpse is inside of the wallet held by Terezi. Dave, Kanaya, Roxy, Carcat, Jade, and Calliope are all on a ship loaned to them by Jake, racing towards Deltritus. Jane, Jake, and Brain Ghost Dirk remain on Earth Sea, kidnapped by Jaspros in Midnight City. Jane's dad is also there, searching for Jane. Alt Calliope seems to be missing, no longer inhabiting Jade's body. In Candy, John, Roxy, Calliope, and Solix are all currently in Roxy's secret lab on the meteor, at the plot point. Harry Anderson is still presumably in his mother's house. Frissy has just escaped from Jane's prison and is in the back of a supply truck. Friska is still inside, crawling in the vents. Jane is at her headquarters, addressing her troops on the situation currently unfolding at the plot point. Jake is still with her, as well as Brain Ghost Dirk. Real Dirk is long deceased in this timeline. Jane's dad has also recently died. Rose, Kanaya, Jade, Tavros, and Yiffy are aboard a Resistance ship. Karkat has also returned to the Resistance, presumably to his headquarters with Mina. Davebot, Aradia, and the corpse of another jade, previously inhabited by Alt Calliope, are also on a ship, which has escaped the black hole that Candy is trapped within. Alt Calliope's whereabouts in this timeline are also currently unknown. Now that you're all caught up, here's to hoping that you stick around for the next update. James and his team seem to have some big plans in store for the story, and quite a few plot threads to pick up. Oh, 
shit. Uh, I didn't think it was already time. Um, welcome, guys. Uh, it's me, Az, and um, I've just got some quick notes for the end of this video, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, I've been making it for a very long time. Um, so much so that there has been a lot more news and a lot more updates since I started it. So I've got some notes here today to uh, kind of help me work through these with you guys. So first of all, more news from James. Everything that goes on the official Homestuck 2 Patreon will eventually be public after two months. That is a big thing that James wanted to make sure we knew. The HSBC team did an AMA on the Homestuck subreddit a few months ago. Uh, some highlights from that include a possibility of a Fortnite and Homestuck collab in the future, which would be pretty weird. And there was a lot of jokes, but maybe not, about a Homestuck gotcha game that may be coming eventually. Overall, just lots of good info. Definitely check it out for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of really insightful commentary there from uh, many members of the team. James originally wanted to know the top 10 Homestuck songs from the community to go on the vinyl, but it looks like we will eventually be getting volumes one through four in their entirety if James can get a hold of everybody on the original music team. So that's cool. Stuck at HomeCon and Vast Error have been officially brought into the HICU, which I edited in uh, little pictures of both of those, but I didn't officially say it, but they are in. The Viz Media deal has been restructured, quote, uh, in a positive way. Andrew still owns Homestuck, and there may be fixes to Homestuck.com and book publishing rights coming soon. So we may actually see more than just the ones that are... Hang on. Yep, I'm pointing at them. The HSBC team is in talks with merch guys, which is cool. Maybe getting some merch soon. Something will occur for the 15 year anniversary of Homestuck, so be on the lookout April 13th. We don't know anything about it yet, but something has been hinted at. And we may see a sound page update soon, which was also hinted at in one of James's news posts. Uh, so that's cool. A lot of good stuff. More updates. First of all, go read these yourself. They're good is the first thing I've written here on my page. Uh, but right after Jane does her proclamation, uh, Jake is eavesdropping on her and reports back to Mina about her plan. Friska Among Us is, is how I've written this. She goes out of the vent from prison and meets up with John and they go back to Roxy's. Alt Calliope is unable to inhabit any jades for a short time and collects herself in the black hole's infinite void. Uh, by collects herself, I mean literally there's different versions of herself and they reconvene into one being. Dave Bot and Aradia bond in her absence, we get some lore about aspects, and weeks later Callie is able to possess dead Jade again. Harry fucks around in his house while John and Roxy talk to Callie at the point. This is like happening simultaneously with the scene right before John finds Solix downstairs. Harry Anderson goes to the park and tries to contact Frissy getting all sappy and romantic until she responds. They meet up and board the Resistance ship. An hour before that, Yiffy and Tavros eavesdrop on a conversation between Rose, Jade, and Kanaya, where they finally air out their dirty laundry about having a secret child among them. Kanaya is fucking pissed. Rightfully so. Uh, Jade reveals that she had Yiffy because no mortal on Earthsea ever saw her for her, and she couldn't properly start a family with Dave. Rose reveals that with her powers, she knew Kanaya would forgive her for this. Which, just a lot of fucked up stuff happening there. Before they can work it out fully, Tavros falls into the room from the ceiling grate, and we see that Jade has something important capsule logged in her pocket. And that officially brings us up to date here with um, Homestuck 2 stuff. Now I have to do some credits. So first of all, big thanks to Jojo Funk McLovin for being the voice of James Roach at the beginning of this video. Find him at Big Funky J on Twitter, good friend of mine. Uh, another good friend of mine, Ty from the podcast Side Character Quest, uh, was the voice of Andrew Hussey at the beginning, uh, at Win Lose Ty for that one. Uh, my good pal Brian for voicing Harry Anderson Egbert at Wi-Fi Boyfriend and Lake for voicing Jane Crocker at Curlybug. And then we also have Fiona K.T. Howitt of the What Am I Rolling podcast for voicing Calliope. And that's uh, at W-A-I-R underscore podcast. Anyway, art credits. Big, 
big ups, big thank yous to Reese at Reese Pupperson, who was a huge help with a lot of the things in this video. Time and time again, I would go back to Reese and be like, hey, I saw that you posted this, can I use it? And by all accounts, they were like, yeah, of course, go, go for it. And then like made some extra stuff for me. Uh, even when I offered to like, hey, if you could just send me the assets, I'll make it myself. They were like, no, I got it. So that's great. Thank you, Reese, so much. You're a huge help. Uh, at Reese Pupperson, go and follow Reese uh, for good homestuck art. Uh, we also had Alphabet Sausage on DeviantArt, who made that one picture of John punching Arania. Thank you for that. Uh, at Galactic Peach on Twitter, who made the Rumble into Pumpkin Patch poster, which I fell in love with immediately. Uh, we got Opal, at Ghost Opal, who did the piece uh, of Dirk making a TikTok about John trying to kidnap Tavros. Uh, and then we also have at 8D Scarlet with two T's. I'll, I'll have it up here. And then uh, Scarlet, spelled like Terezi would spell it, on YouTube for the Commander Carcat and Beat Sideways music tracks that I used in this video. Uh, they both fuck super hard. I love those tracks to death and I listen to them quite a lot. They're actually like cycled into my like usual Homestuck playlist. So that's cool. Um, definitely give all these people follows because they deserve the world. Anyway, we have things that I do uh, because this is the end of the video and it's time for me to plug things. So uh, you can find my other Homestuck works on this channel. I have two other video essays. If you haven't seen them, they are about the Homestuck iceberg and then about Leprechaun romance because people really wanted that. Uh, and there's more coming in the future. You can find some of my work at the Scavengers Network, which is a podcast network that I'm a part of, at Scavengers Net on Twitter, or uh, on their YouTube channel, which is just the Scavengers Network. Uh, on there, I most famously did the Chicken Sandwich Saga, which is me trying a bunch of chicken sandwiches and ranking the best one, which is a lot different than this video, but if that sounds interesting to you, go check it out. Uh, I also on there do a yearly podcast called It Jams For Thee, which is at It Jams For Thee, which is a yearly rewatch and appreciation podcast for the movie Space Jam. Um, we're on year three. It's not a lot to listen to yet, so you can catch up. And most recently, I do the Biodex cast with my friend Macy, that is at Biodex cast, and that is a Pokemon and biology podcast that we do together. So you can check that out as well. We have uh, three episodes out as of right now with uh, an episode about Charmander, Charmeleon, and Charizard coming out very soon. And I also, you can find me a lot on Twitch. I stream with my friend Colin at twitch.tv slash Colin M. Parker. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you want to see more stuff like this, uh, leave a comment, leave a like, um, subscribe if you want, uh, and hit that bell. I hear a lot of people saying that, but I don't really know what it means. But hit that bell. And yeah, just thank you for your support on this channel and expect more Homestuck content coming soon. Thank you.